Ladies and gentlemen, we are back for the second segment of today's Sharpen Word Literary Matinee. Next, we will hear from Dr. Lee Su Kim. Dr. Lee Su Kim is a sixth generation Nyonya with roots to both Penang and Malacca Peranakan communities. And when I read her books, then only I know that there is a difference between the Penang Peranakan and the Peranakans from Malacca and Singapore. She has written 10 books, both fiction as well as non-fiction, and some of the best-selling ones are Malaysian Flavors, Insights into Things Malaysian, uh, based on her column in the Star newspaper, and Manglish, Malaysian English at its wackiest. Uh, her fiction, We've got two, as you can see on the screen. Kabaya Tales of Matriarchs, Maidens, Mistresses and match, Matchmaker and um, Sorrow Secrets of Loss, Love, Loss and Longing. Uh, Dr. Lee is a writer, speaker, language consultant and cultural activist. She was previously Professor Madhya, um, Associate Professor at University Bangsa Malaysia. She has more than 30 years of teaching and research experience. In terms of literary experience, she ha had been invited as a, a speaker in the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival Bali back in 2009 and the Singapore Writers Festival in 2012. So she is no stranger to literary events. Dr. Lee is also the founder member and first woman president of the Peranakan Baba Nyonya Association of Kuala Lumpur and Selangor. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lee Su Kip. Thank you, Madam MC. Thank you, Pak Peter. And thank you, Sharp and Word. For inviting Melissa Chan and myself to uh, this town that has been listed as the number six in the Lonely Planet's list of top places to visit. So congratulations to all the uh, as, uh, as you mentioned just now, I'm no stranger to literary events. I've given many talks before, but this time I'm feeling very intimidated because uh, my grandmother and mother are watching me. Uh, that's my grandmother's Baju Panjang. And that's my mother's uh, kabaya. Uh, Pak Peter asked me to bring some, some uh, sarong kabayas to dress up the mannequins. And as you can see, that mannequin must have been made by a man because she's pretty well endowed. <laughs> and as, as you can see, Nonias in those days were very petite. And I cannot wear a single one of my mother's many kabayas because she was very, very tiny. I've got to go to the shops and buy them. Right, um, so I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about I won't go too much into the Pranakan Babanyoina culture because this is a literary event, so I'm not going to go into a kind of a sociological commentary. I'll just talk very briefly about why I write the stories uh, and then do uh, readings from my books. Okay, slide number one. Um, bullet points one, two, three, four. Can you press, please? And one more. So we are called OCBC. Not because we, bank, we own the banks, maybe Henry Chan does own some, some banks, <laughs> uh, but because we are Orang China, Bukan China. We are supposed to be Chinese, we are very proud of our Chinese identity. Uh, we are even more immersed in all our cultural rites and rituals. We have the Sembayang, we worship our ancestors. Worship not as in asking for four, four digit numbers, but in, in terms of respecting our ancestors. And it's very interesting to see uh, PRC Chinese tourists, tourists from China, the motherland of Chinese, coming to Malacca, Penang, to learn about their Chinese. Right? Because as you know, during the Cultural Revolution, a lot of that was lost. Right? Even if you wore a pair of spectacles or you own some books, you would be killed. So they lost a lot of uh, the knowledge and, and the knowledge of the rites and rituals. So, it's very ironical that this particular ethnic group are very, very Chinese in that respect. 
and yet we call themselves, we call ourselves, what other people call us in the past, OCBC, Orang China, Bukan China. So Peranakan is very uh, widely used now, almost like a commodified thing. Uh, you, you come across things like, oh, Peranakan massage, Peranakan spa. I mean, uh, the Nyonyas in the past had no such thing as a Peranakan massage. The only thing they had to do, they had to always be in the kitchen pounding away at the at the pestle and mortar to make the sambal blachan and toasting the blachan and, and so on. So I always think, what is this thing called Pranakan massage, Pranakan spa? Uh, very loosely used. It's a generic word for uh, some kind of like cross-cultural interactions, encounters, right? Because as you know, in the past, uh, the Chinese came to, to Malaya, settled down in many parts of Malaya, in the East Coast, where they don't call themselves Babas and Nyonyas, they just if you ask, are you Baba Nyonya in Trenggano or Kelantan, like, what's that? You know, we are, we are Chinese, Pranakan Chinese. But because of um, British colonization of this peninsula, and many people say that, well, British coloni colonization led to the emergence of this particular culture. I wouldn't agree with that. It's more because of the conditions then that allowed for this flowering of this particular culture. Because in those days, if you should have, if you should marry a Malay or, or a Muslim, or a Southeast Asian woman, you don't have to convert if she's of Islam. And therefore, um, the culture was able to flourish. Right? So for the Pranakan Chinese from Malacca, Penang, and uh, Singapore, they have a specific word for themselves called the Babas and Nyonyas. Baba for the men, Nyonyas for the women. We also call the Pranakan Chinese, and we have got counterparts from uh, the Indian society. We've got the Pranakan Chiti, and we also have the Pranakan Javi. So it's a very common phenomenon. Um, in Burma, you call the Pranakans, in Vietnam, you call the Pranakans, and so on. We also call the Straits Chinese, and this would be because when we were a British colony, we were part of the Straits Chinese, right? and of course, OCBC. And my Ama Che, um, we had an Ama, who we loved very much working for us. She had this interesting expression for the Pranakan Chinese. She, she called us the Mo Fu Long people. Mo Fu Long, if you know Cantonese, how many of you know what that means? Mo Fu Long is like you don't have, when you wear the trousers, you have a crotch. So because we're always wearing the sarongs, we don't have the crotch in our garments. So we've been called many names. Next slide, please. As mentioned, uh, I'm sixth generation Nyonya. Very fortunate uh, to have links to both because father came from the Malaccan. Uh, Pranakan community, whereas mother comes from the Penang Pranakan communities. Um, so I know Hokkien, Penang Hokkien, as well as no, but not really fluent, uh, in Baba Malay as well. And that was quite sad because when I was in school, it was vital that you must have a distinction in Bahasa Malaysia. So my parents told uh, my grandparents and decided amongst themselves. Don't speak Baba Malay to your children. Otherwise, you're going to say, eh, lu gua, lu, lu gua, and so on. Instead of saya and aku and engkau. So that was like taken away from us, which is to my disadvantage now, because otherwise I can do my Baba Malay expressions even better. <laughs> um, and that's the house that I grew up in, a pre war house, in an in a old street of pre war houses in Sinchuki Street of Jalan Galloway. Just 20 minutes walk from my alma mater, Bukit Bintang Girls School. Uh, we call ourselves VBGS Girls School. Uh, of course, our rivals from Bukit Nanas call us the Big Backside Girls School. <laughs> but we say no, we're Bridget Bardo Girls School. And just 10 minutes away from the VI, Victoria Institution. So of course, I would have loved my house to be like Melissa and Henry Chan's house. If, with that wonderful golden gilt aged uh, uh, um, walls and the marvelous uh, paintings. If ever you go to Malacca, this is a plug, you must visit the Baba Nyonya Heritage Museum. Excellent. Right? Um, my house is quite charming in its own way, although it's not so resplendent. Uh, lovely tiles from Italy, very, very high ceilings, uh, interesting staircase, very, very steep. And uh, one common feature in this old house of mine and the house of the Chans was this peak hole in the front, uh, front room of the room upstairs. Have you seen those peepholes in those rooms where you, you could look down through the peephole onto whoever 
was standing outside the door. So if you look down and you didn't like the person, you just don't open the door and so on. And I remember as children, we used to throw things down to the people and once in a while spit down the, the people. So yeah, like Melissa, there's this sense of nostalgia for the past and for things, lots and lots of things that are dying out. Next slide. So this house is uh, uh, my grandfather's, well, my grand uncle's house. It's in Lorong Panjang, and this is my grandfather. This gentleman here. The oldest son, Mr. Lee Lun Chuan, and his four brothers. It's a wedding of one of the brothers. Two sisters-in-law there, as one sister, and so on. Right. So as you can see, very interesting hybrid culture of Chinese, Malay, uh, Southeast Asian, Balinese, Thai, and so on. And of course, the European layers coming in because Malacca was colonized by the Dutch and the Portuguese and the British. So fascinating culture with many, many um, uh, different cultural components. Right. Um, back to the previous slide. Sadly, they say wealth only lasts three generations. So when I go back to look for this old house, I can't find it anymore because it's been passed down to the third generation and this person has just sort of modified it and altered it and is trying to turn it into some bed and breakfast or something and it's just beyond recognition. No more as beautiful as it used to be. Next slide. So our stories really need to be told. Um, lately, for the past 20, 30 years, there has been a resurgence of interest in the culture. At one time, was, we, were, we were told that we're going to be like the dodo bird. We're going to disappear. We're just going to you know, become extinct. But now there's a great resurgence. If you have a nyonya plate, it is now worth a lot of money because it's now on Sotheby's. Um, a kabaya can fetch you anything up to 6,000 ringgit. And old antique sarong can cost as much. Um, so there's a tremendous interest of... of a tremendous resurgence of interest in the culture, in the material culture. And there are lots of books on the culture, but the books are mainly on the material culture. Right? So you've got books on silverware, kabayas, for example, the late Latin Endon's book on, on uh, the kabaya, on sarongs, uh, on the architecture, and of course, tons of books on nyonya food. Right? Nyonya has, has become an adjective, isn't it? Nyonya koi, nyonya fish, nyonya nyonya curry and so on. Um, but, strangely, not just for the Pranakans, the Baba Nyonyas, strangely there are no stories, not very many stories. There have been a few autobiographical and biographical books. For example, uh, Queenie Chang, Twilight of Nyonyas, Roof Ho, Rainbow Around My Shoulder, Yap Ju Kim, The Petra, but not very many uh, fiction stories. Uh, okay, bullet points. Can you press, please? So I thought, why not try, after having done quite a number of non-fiction stories, uh, books, why not try fiction, right? Because it's such a rich, uh, interesting culture. Lots of uh, cultural hybridity, colorful, eccentric personalities. I mean, come on, I've got an uncle, two uncles in Penang called Or Kao and Pek Kao, you know? I mean, Or Kao means black dog and Pek Kao means white dog, you know? This kind of the interesting uh, cultural things where you don't give good names to your children because then people get jealous and then your child will die. So give them terrible names. Uh, also an uncle in Penang called Bluebeard because he had lots of affairs and lots of concubines. And when he died, uh, all his mistresses came out from the woodwork with the little children in tow. You know? uh, so interesting flamboyant personalities. You've got interesting names that be big gummo or see, see Sibodo and Sibuta and things like that, right? Um, and if, in, uh, complex family relationships, obsession with food, complex rites and rituals, and intangible cultural heritage. So this is the hardest thing to keep and to preserve, right? The intangible cultural heritage, our stories. Not just the stories of the Baba Nyonya, stories of the, of the uh, Sin, Sin Ning Yang, Yang of the Teochew, of the Ibans, of the Dayaks, if you don't start writing our stories, uh, where are they going to go to? As Melissa says, they're all disappearing. So I was lucky to be born. Uh, next slide. <coughs> next slide. I was lucky to, to live in an extended family. Live with my parents, a sister and brother, and my grandparents in a, in a home in Sinjuki, in, in KL. 
And because grandmother was there, that's my grandma, and, and, oh, that's my paternal grandma. That one, the, that baju panjang belongs to my maternal grandma. Uh, so because there were seniors there, there were always people dropping in to visit, right? Aunties or friends, because the house is right in town, in the center, in the heart of town, on the edge of the Golden Triangle. So there were lots of people always coming by, there was always lots of chatter. This picture is a picture of my parents. Father and mother were both very good in English. Uh, mother was from Poodle English Girls School and father was from BI. And of course, many trips to Port Dickson during the holidays. And that photograph there is a uh, maternal grandfather. So in the house, there would be all kinds of languages being spoken. In the morning, we had a strong, thick Malaccan coffee. In the afternoon, we had English tea. And at night, uh, mother or chao che, our Amma would make Chinese herbal soups. So one day it's like okay, Malay, English, or, or Chinese, or whatever, and all kinds of languages. Father, father and mother spoke English. Mother also spoke Hokkien. Mother could spout out um, quotations from Shakespeare. Um, grandmother spoke Hakka, Cantonese, Baba Malay. Grandfather spoke Baba Malay, uh, and the Amma spoke um, Cantonese. So wonderful array of languages. Sadly. I speak English to my son. So it's, a, it's, it's actually exactly a kind of reflection of what's going to happen. Everything is sort of like disappearing and being lost. Um, so next slide. So in every family, uh, if we have a storyteller, if someone who is a custodian of, of stories, that would be good, right? In, in my family, my mother was a storyteller. She loved telling stories. Uh, she was in a good relationship with my father because father liked to listen. Father was a strong, silent type. His mother was the one who was acting and, and using onomatopoeia, zhing, zhang, zhing, actions and all. And people loved to come and sit there and listen to her. And fortunately then, fortunately then, I did not have a smartphone. So I was listening. If, I, if, if it had happened now, I think I won't have the stories. I'd be too busy chatting on the chat groups. Right? So now it's a lot of chatter, but it's all lots of chatter on the chat rooms. And if someone phones me, it's like, oh, why can't they just send a WhatsApp? But in those days, people actually talked, right? Uh, and that's my mother, in, uh, the lady here to the right, and that's her sister. And while I have the kabayas, I wonder where have all these gorgeous sarongs gone? They're, they're not in the cupboard anymore. And I think, as I mentioned before in the previous talk, uh, when the nyonya dies, we put the sarongs into the coffins. We are kind of worried that wherever they go, there aren't any sarongs up there. So sadly, that was a mistake, you know. Um, because the sarongs are very, very precious. Right, next slide. So interesting things like my mother would say, never trust a man till he's dead. Because the neighbor across the road, a very stern, uh, strict accountant, when he died, his mistresses turned up as well, just like my uncle the Bluebeard. So my mother was saying, never trust a man till his day. Then you know whether your, husband, your papa was a good man or not. Uh, and then one day, uh, next slide, an auntie, an old auntie turned up to, uh, in a taxi to our house crying and weeping. A very lovely old grand aunt who had two very good children. One was a, maybe I shouldn't say too many things. Well, both had very good professions. But uh, the son threw out of the house, so she went to the daughter's house. The daughter says, why should I take care of you? You go to your son's house. So he went to the son's house and said, no, you go to the daughter. And she was just being thrown to and fro because her husband had made the mistake of writing in his will that the property and everything should go to the children. Being so sure that the children would take care of her, but that didn't happen. So she turned up at our house crying, like, can you help me? My, my children were up in anak, uh, you know, tak mau gua. So we had to take her in for a while and grandma would say, hmm. Heaven has eyes. Teen Yao Ngan, if you say that. And uh, this, another um, bullet point, please. Go Chiam Tua Kui Gu Chia Lian. Those of you who know Penang Hokkien would know this. Uh, the Penang Hokkiens. I don't want to stereotype, but yeah, this is a stereotype that they're very, very Yam Siap, right? Go to a dentist and have a feeling of someone's, ah, oh, a dentist, a doctor, can you discount or not? Very, very uh, tight fisted. And even my own mother, who was from Penang, when she walked, she would look down. Sometimes when she went for a walk in the street, she would look down. 
Like, why are you looking down? Just in case somebody has dropped some money, she say. <laughs> and to my amazement, she always picks up about $1, $0.10, cents, $0.20, cents, that kind of streak, you know, the strong, uh, tight-fisted Penang streak. And every room you go, she'll switch off the lights. When you move to this room, she'll switch off that light and so on. Right? So again, uh, this is a challenge. It's a wonderful expression go jump uh, five cents bigger than Bullock Cut Wheel, which I wrote into a story about a nyonya who was so tight-fisted that in the end her husband ran away and married a mistress and spent all his money on the mistress instead. Um, so lots of interesting conversations and chatter. Next slide. Oh, sorry, this slide. So mother told me a lot about uh, Japanese occupation, how she was so bitter uh, that because of the Japanese occupation, she never had a chance to really enjoy her girlhood. She was like 20, you know, the best years of her life. No parties, no beautiful dresses. Had to cut the hair short, cover herself with charcoal and dirt and try to look ugly in case the Japanese men came around. Because they did come around knocking on the door, gunian, 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 which means women, women, we want women. So that was a fascinating load which I wanted to mine. And I wrote that into a story called The Tenant, Tenant in uh, my second book called Sarum Secrets. And also, she also worked for the Japanese for a while. They had to go and work. And she told me about the story of how her boss was very good to her, this Japanese boss. But one day, he started crying and crying and crying. And she asked why. And he said, Hiroshima, Hiroshima. You know. And at that time, she had no idea what nerve was Hiroshima. You know. But of course, uh, hindsight, we know what happened to him, right? Uh, also, very complex family problems and relationships lend themselves well to stories. But of course, when you write stories from your own uh, repertoire of stories, that's a problem. <clears throat> What's the problem? What's the problem when you write your stories? You don't want your uncle or your nieces to come and sit by you and say, hello, how dare you write about me? <laughs> right? So, that, so you have to sort of fictionalize it and so on and uh, change as much as possible and yet use these interesting nuggets uh, to, to weave the stories. So I had this story which my mother told me. I know this, this particular cousin. Uh, she worked as uh, a croupier in, uh, in a casino and she fell in love with this handsome young man who liked to go up to Genting Highlands to play uh, blackjack or, or roulette or whatever they play up in Genting Highlands. And they sort of fell in love. <coughs> and well, when you fall in love, you exchange pleasantries, etc. But I think they didn't compare notes about their parents. So they dated, and I don't know how far the relationship went, but they were really getting serious. But eventually, to their horror, they found that they were from the same father. Father had five wives. So the boy was from wife number one, and the girl was from wife number five. So, you know, hopefully they found out before it was too late. And also interesting cultural oddities. Um, I'm sure you've, you, you've, you've heard about expressions like if, if you're pregnant, you mustn't start doing interior decoration in the house. You mustn't start knocking things on the wall because if you have a baby, he's, he's going to have a cleft lip, right? Or uh, the story of my auntie in Malacca who was, uh, I think, what was she doing? Chopping, cutting up some animal. Uh, preparing some kind of food in the kitchen when suddenly a monkey because she lives in a beautiful kind of well, house in the garden um, and this monkey sort of jumped on her and she was very startled and she was pregnant then and when the baby was born and he's my uncle he looked like a little monkey very hairy, you know so it's like uh, how do you write this what would you call this cultural phenomenon Yes. What would you call it? Buddy. 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 Okay. How do you spell it? B A D I. Never saw it. Never saw it in the reason for All right. Okay. So with four four degrees in English, I couldn't find a word. I couldn't use the word bewitch. I couldn't use enchanted. I can't. I couldn't use snook snookered. I couldn't use uh, uh, what possessed. There wasn't a word, and I consulted, you know friends and people in the English language business and it wasn't the word. So I had to use the, the local word, kenachiong, you know. He has kenachiong. And write a story out of that. So when you write from your culture, but in a language that comes from Mother England, 8,000 miles away, uh, there are challenges, but it is then up to us to, to write this and to tell 
the world about such interesting things. And I wrote a story called Promise is a Promise. Okay? Uh, I think I won't take over. I've still got one more minute before I, write, I read the story. Next. So uh, with all these stories, I decided to write a book. Why not try and write a book about, about the Nyonya and Babas? And this book must have been inspired by a garment because I wanted to write the stories and between each story have a picture of a kabaya. Because kabayas, as you know, in those days were very much bespoke, very customized. Not like today you can go and buy 150 uh, size S, M and L. In those days, you bring your precious uh, rupiah of oil or Swiss oil and then you tell your, your kabaya maker, I want, like in, for example, my mother's kabaya, the gentleman's thing. <laughs> She brought this uh, burgundy Swiss royal to the uh, kabai maker and told her I want this particular pattern, leaves with pink flowers and a bit of an European English touch, right? Not garish purple, orange flowers, like some, what some kabai makers do nowadays. Some kabayas come out looking like a Chinese New Year card. Um, in those days, very subtle colors, right? And uh, very, very much customized. So I wanted to have, between each story, pictures of kabayas. Anyway, it was a challenge because um, the publishers told me, no, you can't have pictures in, in colors. You can have all the pictures you want, but they must be all in black and white, which was horrible to me because to a nyonya, black and white is, are the colors of death, right? So my community will not be happy if I come out with black and white photographs. So I wrote a six-page letter uh, ranting at the publishers. I hey, you promised that you would do this, and I have to have it in color and blah, blah and so on. Luckily, I persisted and I succeeded and the book was published uh, in 2011, January. And then I was like, oh my gosh, who's going to read grandmother's stories? Right? But to my surprise, the first print run was sold out within three months. Uh, in Malaysia, print runs aren't very much anyway, maybe about 1,500, but at least it was sold out. And so now the book has gone into its third print run, which just means that, next, uh, next slide, that actually Malaysians do like to read about themselves, right? Such stories are appreciated. And these are re uh, extracts of reviews. And also in August, it won the first prize in the Popular Star Reader's Choice Awards. So that was it. But then after that, I decided, next slide, to do a another book because I still had some more stories called Sarong Secrets. And I like what this review has said. Delicate as a kabaya, spice the tang of sambal rata. Next slide. And in this book, uh, I put in sarongs, pictures of sarongs between each story. This was easier because sarongs have got very interesting motives. So in the story of this nyonya who loves to cook, I try to get um, sarongs with motives of pots and pans and belanga, but of course, that's not possible. So I put in sarongs with motives of fish and roosters and chickens and ducks and so on, right? Next slide. Oh, the Nyonyas, for some strange reason, love butterflies, right? And butterflies symbolize longevity and uh, happiness to the Nyonyas. Okay, next slide. I won't spend too much time talking about the writing process, maybe later in the Q&A. Next slide. And this is, well, I've not told anyone publicly yet, so I, this is the first time I'm sharing this. Uh, after I finished Kabaya Tales and Sarong Secrets, I thought, okay, that's it. Been there, done that. I've completed the outfit, Kabaya Tales, Sarong Secrets. And then a few months later, the publisher writes to me and says, hello, how about a trilogy? Why didn't you do another one? And she even designed a cover uh, using orange, and this is supposed to be to represent the beading, because the Nonyas, as you know, like to wear colorful beaded shoes. So I've worked on it, I'm only like halfway through, five stories, uh, aiming for 10 stories. So it's a very bad place to be because I can't get in nor get out now. I'm exactly half at the halfway point. And unlike Kabaya Tales, where so many stories now, I really have to dig hard. I have to interview people and come up with stories. And the stories this time are slanted towards the Babas, right? And I'm thinking of a topic, uh, a title, uh, Manic Mischiefs, and the subtitle has to be something catchy and maybe in the same vein as the previous subtitles, where there's alliteration, I'm thinking of, maybe you could participate here. I'm thinking of, of Playboys, 
paramours, and, and I can't find any other word. <laughs> and what? Philanderous. okay. <laughs> if you thus become that title, you get a free book. <laughs> Something of Playboys. Uh, the publisher says, why not just a Playboys, Paramours, and Plenty More? <laughs> so it's still up in the air right now. Next slide. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'll read uh, the story. Since Melissa has uh, put a very love, given us a very lovely setting of old Malacca, this story is called Boxed in Bibi. And it's set in Malacca and all the trials and tribulations that take place when the Petra, or in this case, the Metra dies. I'm timing myself, 15 minutes for each story, two stories. Boxed in Bibi. The Matra passed away at the age of 89. She was given a grand send-off in a lavish funeral, replete with banners, gongs, Buddhist monks, reciting prayers for the safe passage of a soul, a five-night wake and a marching band. When they put me into the coffin, I want the band to play taps. Ingat tau, she told her favorite daughter-in-law, Janet. Don't you dare forget. Such a sad tune, guaranteed to make everyone cry. She fixed a toothless grin at Janet, chuckled and chuckled, looking quite pleased with herself. And remember, the nghe, I want a nine-piece band, not a miserly three-piece band like what si, si apa tu? Si guat niao had. I want a grand funeral. Don't stint, okay? There'll be plenty of money left from what your pa left me. She nagged the children in her more lucid moments. So the family had to look for a marching brass band. It was hard to find a nine-piece band. The local funeral parlor in Malacca had a four-man band comprising rickety, creaky, creaky octogenarians who looked as if one more puff on the trombone would send them to meet their maker. Finally, the manager of QQ Blossom Nightclub and Cabaret at Jalan Bandera was, was persuaded to allow five members of his band to moonlight as funeral musicians. The old lady had lived such a frugal lifestyle, it became extremely harrowing to certain members that she got more and more extravagant, the more ill and dying she became. I have already given instructions to Janet, she croaked to her family, summoned to her bedside on yet another false alarm. After I am dead, I want to be dressed in my most expensive kabaya. Janet knows which one. My best corosa and my diamond earrings and my favorite slippers, the red kasut mane. Don't anyone dare go against my wishes. What? Rosie, daughter-in-law number one, who had been doing a poor job of massaging the matriarch's shoulders, jerked upright, forgetting to maintain the staccato-like clumsy needy. She had hoped that Bibik's gorgeous corosa, three delicate brooches of filigree gold, metalwork studded with diamond flakes linked by a dainty gold chain would fall into her hands when this bossy old cow died. But now this wrinkled vein pot wants to wear her three carat diamond earrings as well. What next? What the hell? Who the hell is going to look at her wherever she's going? If this old loony went on like this, the entire family would go bankrupt. I didn't marry the eldest son of this family for nothing, fumed Rosie. And don't forget my gold antlers, said Bibi. I want to go out in style. <laughs> and my silver belt, the one with the biggest buckle. Make sure you fasten my sarong properly. Okay? Nanti sarong jatuh. <laughs> Croaked the old Bibi, enjoying her own body humor as she winked at Janet and glared at Rosie. If she lives another week, your crazy mother will decide to give everything to charity next. What are we to do, Bong Eng? You are the oldest son. Do something. Rosie complained bitterly to her husband that evening over dinner. Diamla, what do you expect me to do? Can't you be patient for once? She won't be around much longer. He snapped back at her. One Sunday morning, the family was summoned to Bibik's home again. The doctor warned them that her time was nearly up. 
This time, they were sure it wasn't a false alarm. They gathered around the bedside in the large dark room upstairs. The old bibic lay half submerged in a king-sized bed, surrounded by pillows, blankets, and hot water bottles. She had tubes sticking in and coming out of her. The colonoscopy bag, which she called her jamban bag, contained a few ugly streaks of bile. She was still alert, her eyes darting about the room, her breath coming in loud, noisy rasp. She kept pointing to something at the foot of the bed. I see two persons, Dua or Rang, there, there, in front of me. They are waiting. Ma, Nya, it's time to go, she mumbled, her hands trembling, her bony fingers jabbing in the air. A large family of two daughters, two sons, in-laws, grandchildren and great-grandchildren gathered around her, weeping and sobbing. My mother, she's waiting for me. I can see her, Ma. Her relatives could see no one but were edgy, frightened at the thought of an unseen presence. Boon Eng, her son, kneeling beside the bed, suddenly howled like a coyote, a coyote in a cheap western spaghetti movie. He grabbed her hand and blasted it against her cheek. The tragic expression on his face was limited to his twitching facial muscles. His eyes remained cold and unfeeling. Ma, 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 don't go. Stop, 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 don't go. You are my everything, he sobbed. His mother's piercing gaze would have frightened even Boon Ing himself had he looked up at her. But he was bent over, shoulders heaving, trying to get his tear ducts to function. Ella Boon Ing, look so cakap lagi. All talk and no action. How much more do you want? She called for Janet, her favorite daughter-in-law. Janet, Janet, where are you? Oh, sorry. Janet, Janet, where are you? Bibi wants to say something to you. Rosie screeched jealously, flapping gratuitously around her mother-in-law. Best sister-in-law of mine. You can never find her when you want her. I'm here, said Janet, standing quietly in the doorway. She squeezed her way through to the front. Ah, Janet, come here. The old baby smiled fondly at her daughter-in-law and reached out weakly for her hand. Take good care of the house, huh? she instructed Janet. Then her voice took on a strong, urgent timbre. You will clear up my room when I'm gone, yeah, Janet? Come sell you, Janet. Yes, baby, don't worry about such things. Uh, comforted Janet. Rosie, leaning over to eavesdrop, smirked when she heard what Bibi was asking Janet to do. Ah, poor Janet, ever the doormat. Janet was married to Bibi's second son, Boon Wan. They both lived in the family home with Bibi. When Bibi became very ill, it was Janet who gave up her teaching job to take care of the old lady. Although Bibi had two daughters, they were not too keen to become caregivers, preferring to leave it all to Janet. But Janet was safe. Rosie was sure of it. The guileless, this guileless, insipid thing. Not a scheming nerve in the brain or body. The unpaid night Florence Nightingale. It was Janet who emptied the contents of the night chamber pot, fed and massaged the old woman, emptied the colonoscopy bag, administered the painkillers. Yes, you can always depend on good old Janet, the woman with the eternal scent of death all. Janet's cheeks were wet with tears as she reached out to hug the old lady and whisper goodbye, baby. Thank you for all your kindness to me. How strange, Janet thought. Did the old lady just give me a wink? Or was she grimacing from the pain afflicting her? The matriarch looked at everyone in the room, her gaze resting a little while longer on her only great-grandchild. She sighed and closed her eyes. The matriarch went to sleep and never woke up again. Hardly a fortnight had passed when Boon Ing's car came squealing up the driveway of the family home and Boon Ing and Rosie emerged, slamming the doors, the car doors. Open up, open up, Janet, screeched Rosie as her husband banged on the wooden slats of the huge door with his car keys. Janet dashed hurriedly out of the kitchen to open the door. Boon Ing and Rosie stormed into the hall. I want to know where's my mother's nyonya wear, as I'm the oldest son. It belongs to me and Rosie now, Boon Eng demanded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where's all the crockery gone? Huh? Wow, don't simply quietly sapu everything, okay? And where's the blue and the white English tea set? The one in the Queen Elizabeth head? 
demanded Rosie. Bibi said it's mine. Where's Boon Wan? Call your husband here, Janet, and let's get this settled. How dare you take your mother's things without asking me? Boon Ing commanded Janet. Janet was sickened by the wild accusations. What are you talking about? I've lived here ever since I got married. I've been using the same place and cups and spoons for the past 15 years. I haven't taken anything. You can take whatever you want. Just then, Boon Guan stepped into the hall and hearing the commotion. Big brother, everything has been settled and divided fairly and equally. What are you squabbling about? Mother is turning in the grave at your behavior. Janet walked away, refusing to interfere any further. She could hear the two brothers yelling at each other and Rosie goading her husband. Just as Bibik had predicted, greed was tearing the family apart. One day, after another terrible row, row the night before, between the siblings over the will, <coughs> Janet decided to spring clean the house. She remembered what the old lady had told her, to take good care of the house. Donning an apron and armed with a bucket, a mop and a broom, she began a thorough clean-up of the family home. She started with her mother-in-law's bedroom. When she began clearing the cupboards, she was shocked to find that the old lady had hidden away stacks and stacks of money amongst the clothes. Janet found on the uppermost shelf two piles of stiffly starched Pakalongan sarongs, which Bibi hardly wore. Slipped into the folds of each sarong, nestled between the motifs of hummingbirds, phoenixes, and butterflies, were dollar notes in huge denominations. There was more. Under the paper lining of each shelf, there were bills, dried jasmine flowers, receipts from goldsmith shops, and more dollar notes. Bibik's jewelry collection, which she kept in a musical box on the dressing table, had long been whisked away by the daughters. But Janet found more jewelry items bound in dainty lace handkerchiefs, stuffed in old brocade pouches, under piles of junk. Janet was stunned. Breathless, she sank onto the chair beside the bed, the chair which she had used when caring for her ailing mother-in-law. She would have to inform Boon Guan and return all this cash in jewellery. There was no way she could keep them. Brother-in-law Boon Eng would kill her if he knew. Just then, a little round box, one in which the old lady kept a potpourri, fell out of the cupboard. It rolled around in lazy, ever smaller circles, until finally, it ended right at Janet's feet. <clears throat> Janet opened the little box with trembling hands. There were no dollar notes nor jewels inside, but there was a folded piece of paper. Janet rolled away the creases of the note. It was written in a mother-in-law's neat handwriting. One last request. Finders, keepers, Janet. <laughs> Can I have some water? Um, I'm making time. All right, managed to do it within 13 minutes. And just one more story. So that was set mainly, uh, I think, back in the 1960s, 70s. And then uh, in this book, Abai Tales, I set the initial stories are set in the older, well, Dulu color, old, uh, late in the uh, late 19th, well, late 18th, 19th century, and it moves on to more contemporary times. And this book called Sun Boy and Sisters is a story of a young girl, a, a teenager, is told uh, through her eyes. She's a protagonist and she's got three gorgeous looking sisters and it's all about the love lives and the matrimonial prospects of her three sisters. Uh, it picks up on the theme of this cleavage between the straits born Chinese in the past. Of course now we are all Malaysia bully. But in the past, um, the Straits Chinese, after having intermarried with the lo local people and so on, became a very elitist, endogamous group. And they began to have like airs and like, Yee, you cannot marry that guy, a China Lombong just came off the boat. So there was this split, like, either you're Pranakan or you're China Gig. And they had this word China Gig. Right? And that's why they call us OCBC. So there's this marriage, uh, this protagonist, her, pair of, her father is China and the mother is a nyonya. And they've got different views on life, and when it came to the three daughters marrying, that's when the problems come in. Sun Boy and Sisters. So her, this girl's name is Sun Boy. I'm fed up, 
sick of friends teasing me about my name. Sun Boy, S-O-N-B-O-Y, that's my name. Sounds all right, you may think. Only problem is, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. It's not like my parents that ran out of names when mum became pregnant for the fourth time. All my three sis elder sisters have exquisite names. My elder sister is named Ruby, my second sister Sophia, my third sister Emerald. Then dad got fed up. I want a boy, he told, his, he told my mum. A friend had told him his girls' names were too beautiful and the spirits were jealous and would continue bestowing him with daughters. That's when he panicked. So when I was born, mum was quite happy to be blessed with another girl. She already had a name in mind, husband. Let's call her Diamond. No, no more of your fanciful names. Oh. Enough for Ruby, Ruby, Sophia, Emerald, Diamonds. I already have a name for her, Sun Boy. <laughs> what? Sun Boy? So, are you crazy? No daughter of mine is going to be called by that ridiculous name. The strategy. After Sun Boy, you'll definitely get a boy. What happened to your biology lessons? Don't be absurd. Oh, you'll be surprised. Dr. Tao, my feng shui master, told me you've got to break the chain. You're out of your mind if you think I'm going to, to uh, let you name my daughter that name. I was too young to know what transpired, but Ruby told me much later there was a big fight and Dad got his way and I was named Sun Boy. Mum wouldn't speak to Dad for weeks after that, but they must have connected again because a year later, Mum got pregnant and this time it was a boy. Dad couldn't stop gloating for days. He wanted to name his firstborn son after some famous Chinese military officer, but mum insisted on Arthur, as in King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Bah! You and your stupid English literature and your bloody English heroes. Why can't you be more Chinese? Why all these poncy English names? You straight-born people are very weird. Grumbled dad who was born into a Cantonese family in Goping and had a very Chinese upbringing and Mandarin medium education. I didn't hear you complaining when you were courting me, snapped mum. Oh, now I'm weird, is it? Back then, I was a dusky, exotic nonya. You're the one who's weird calling our daughter Sunboy. Don't blame me if she starts growing hair on her chest. <laughs> okay, 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 let's compromise then. Finally, the agreed to settle on the full works. My little brother was named after both the English king as well as a Chinese general. And his name was Arthur Lo Sunzi. We all preferred to call him Arthur. <coughs> During those growing up years, we were quite a close-knit family. Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, Arthur and I, Sun Boy. The problems came on thick and fast when we reached adulthood and my sisters started to get the attention of the opposite sex. All three of them were beautiful, I have to admit. With names like that, you get a head start. I suppose I'm the, I, on the other hand, was quite plain with stubby, stubborn, spiky hair and lousy skin. Ruby has thick black hair with reddish tints. She drove all her boyfriends crazy with desire, I'm sure of that. She was studying economics at the University of London and was about to graduate and return to Malaysia when she called up one day to tell, to tell us she wasn't. She had fallen in love with an Irish man, a postgraduate student in political science whom she had met at an Irish bar. They planned to get married soon and wanted mum and dad to give their blessings. Mum, who grew up on the diet of Barbara Cartland, and Dennis Robbins, cooed with excitement. Oh, of course, Ruby, how romantic. Uh, any chance is a marquee or a lot? Oh, for heaven's sake, mum, he's Irish, Ruby replied. It was dad who objected, and so angrily it took us all by surprise. What? Marry a Quailo? Are you crazy? No daughter of mine is going to marry a Kwailo. This started another big fight between mum and dad. What's wrong with a Kwailo? Stop calling people devils, will you? It's embarrassing. You China born types are all suffering from the opium war mentality. Ruby says Ma Malaki is a wonderful man. Ma 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 what? What, 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 what what's his name again? Malaki O'Connor, a future son-in-law. She loves him deeply. Ma 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 Foot. Ma Foot she does. I'm not going to have some ginger head, freckled little Angmo, Angmo kids running all around with Chinese eyes, running around the house. No, I don't give, I don't agree. I forbid it. Oh, grow up husband for heaven's sake. No one's asking you for permission in the first place. Only your blessings. 
It's the 80s. It's a different world today. We don't have any say. We can only be there for them if things go, lo- go wrong. I worked so hard all my life, and what do I get? Do I, do I, do I need this? Now my golf buddies will all laugh at me and my grandchildren. It's <laughs> based on true story, but nuggets of it. Oh, son boy. What's chapalang, dad? I butted, I butted, butted it. Chapalang is what you get if you don't mind your own business. But out, son boy. Concentrate on your max homework. Chapalang is a Malaysian bigot's definition for the offspring of mixed marriages, boy. Mom tried to educate me. Dad wrote to Ruby and threatened he would disown her if, he married, if she married this Irish boyfriend. He ordered her to return home to Kuala Lumpur as soon as she finished her courses, where he would then give her a brand new BMW, a cushy job as director in his companies, and a Rolex watch. He would introduce her to his Chinese business tycoon friends, many of whom had very eligible sons, who would make very good sons-in-laws and good husbands. Ruby's reply was, thank you, but no thanks. Ruby was quite the chip of the old block. A cringe knowing full well the battle of wills ahead. Sure enough, that made life miserable, yelling at everybody and kicking our poor Monglu, Kute, more often than usual. After downing three glasses of single malt scotch, Lafroid, with tiny amounts of water, he called his lawyer and announced loudly for everyone to hear, Mr. Gucharan Singh, I want you to change my will. Strike out my eldest daughter Ruby's name. No share of my property for her, you hear me? He growled, then told mum to inform Ruby. This didn't seem to bother Ruby one bit. She and the sweetheart, Malaki, flew to his hometown, Limerick, in Ireland a fortnight later and got hitched. All was quiet for some time. No one dared bring up the topic of Ruby's marriage for a while, till things cooled down. Then one night, we were halfway through dinner when the phone rang. It was a call from my second sister, Sophia, studying law at the University of Kent. Sophia was attractive in a cool, classy way, clearly the smartest of us all, very well read, a real intellectual type, extremely articulate. I couldn't understand half the bombastic words she uses. She could out-talk anyone. Dad had big plans for her to work for his company and sue anyone so that she could sue anyone who dared cross him. Mum answered the call in the second hall and was on the line for quite some time. Meanwhile, Dad was enjoying his dinner of stir-fried vegetables with ginkgo nuts and steamed white pomfret in soya sauce with mushrooms. He was in a calm mood as his wife had finally complied with his wishes after his grumbling and cooked him a proper Chinese meal. He had enough of her spicy nonya curries and raging hot sambal dishes. I love mum's peranakan dishes. Her mum complained it was very chow, very chai, very lao hei, very heaty and gave, and gave him indigestion. Mum came into the kitchen with a strange expression and said, <coughs> That was Sophia. I have good news and bad news, husband. The bad news is she has broken up with her childhood sweetheart from Jalan Pudu, Lam Akau. Dad was very happy. <laughs> That's not bad news. Oh. That's very good news. Never can stand that pimply, mousy thing. And what kind of name? Imagine our Sophia being called Mrs. Lam Akau. <laughs> and what's the good news? Asked as Dad when Mum kept quiet. The good news is she has found someone else. A South African journalist. <laughs> she met at a civil rights demonstration in London last month. <laughs> Dad spluttered on his double boiled chicken soup with, with winter melon. Uh, 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 what? Uh, uh, African? You call that good news? That's bad news, censored, right? I didn't say African. I said South African. I don't care if it's North, South, East, or West. African. African. Say what? Uh, T.C. Nah. Has she gone mad? What's wrong with Asian men? Nah? Why African? What are my daughters trying to do to me? What Sun King? Chinese Dad started swearing and could hardly swallow another mouthful. You sent your daughters to widen the horizons, didn't you? It's to the credit they're not color fixated like you. And stop swearing in Cantonese, will you? So crude. <coughs> ah, 
I send them to get an education, the important paper qualification. I didn't ask them to bring back the United Nation. <laughs> Sunboy. Sunboy. But in a... Uh, 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 are South Africans black or white there? Huh, Mom? Shut up lah! Eat your Chinese mushrooms! That yell. Then tried to persuade Sapphire to dump the African sweetheart and return home ASAP. The promises of a deluxe condominium in Monkara, Mercedes-Benz S-Class Series, country, country class membership and two low legs watch. She didn't even have to work if she didn't want to. Sapphire sent home a response about um, using complicated polosyllabic words which dad and mum couldn't even understand. Things like metaphysics of physical attraction and divinity of love. <laughs> Juxtaposed with the transient nature of material wealth. She also enclosed a photocopied article about bondage, about petty, about pa patriarchy and the female condition. Dad could not fathom a word. Look, look, look at my household. Look at all the thousands of hard-earned dollars. What, had this, what has it done to her brain? Gone cuckoo already. That complaint. Why are you freaking out? She's just dating him. She hasn't even talked to marriage yet. Who yo? She better wash out or else I call my lawyer Gujaran Singh again. <laughs> he threatened. You know Sophia, she drives on ideas, ideology. Your money doesn't matter a bit to her. It's all your fault, you stupid woman. You and your atifati notions of love you've been feeding our daughters with. Well, excuse me, they sure are a lot cleverer than me in my choices, in their choices. Sunboy, ouch, ouch. I muttered quietly, just in case I got told to shut up again. All eyes were on the last daughter, Emerald, now. Arthur and I were still too young to get tangled in this girl-boy business. I didn't even dare tell anyone I was having a crush on my senior head prefect in my school. Emerald was dad's favourite, and I was sure she would deliver. Deliver what I don't know, but no way she would go against Dad's wishes. I was sure of that. Dad wasn't that sure, I think, because he refused to send her to the UK. He decided to send her to Singapore, to the National University of Singapore. Plenty of normal bachelors there. I heard him pronounce to mother. Mother rolled her eyes in disgust. Emerald did not protest. She was a sweet, gentle girl, always laughing, very manja, touchy feely, loves soft toys, Mozart, cries over sad movies. Sentimental like mum. After her first year at university, I sensed something was wrong. She didn't call home anymore or come back for visits. Then, <coughs> one day, a letter came in the mail from Emerald addressed to mum. And I got to hear the contents when dad came home from work. Mum said, I have news from Emerald. I won't do the good news, bad news routine this time. Okay, husband, you figure it out. What, 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 what? Does she need more money? I've already topped up her bank account. Just given her another supplementary credit card. She doesn't want your money. She wants your understanding. Understanding what? She is in love with uh, uh, half a Chinese. What, what, what do you mean by half a Chinese? You're either Chinese or you're not Chinese. No halfway business. What is this half Chinese? She's in love with a Chindian. What? What tribe is that? I didn't know that. I didn't know there are tribes in Singapore. Oh, for goodness sake. It's not a tribe. It's half Chinese, half Indian. Chinese Indian? Wow. How the heck can that happen? Many things can happen, dear husband, that are beyond your limited comprehension. So, so what, what, what's the Chinese name? Dad demanded. It doesn't have a Chinese name. His mother is Chinese. His father is Indian. Actually, not Indian, but Sri Lankan. His surname is Chandra Segar Segarin. Some boy pipes in. That makes him a Chini Lankan or a Lankachi, that? <laughs> I piped in, uh, some boy piped in happily. Dad flopped down on his chair and clutched his chest. <gasps> uh, Mum, do I call the doctor or the lawyer? Shut up, boy, Mum said. Thank you. <laughs>